What do you think makes a place hot? I said before, what was the phenomenon that it became international? People flew in from all over the world just to go there. What, what made it such a... I don't know. I, 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 you know, in a club, it's all about capturing a moment. When you walk through those blacked out doors, you are in another world. Anyone that was allowed in uh, was totally free inside. Steve and I had no idea what it would really mean or that it would last only 33 months. It just captured everybody's imagination. You could be next to Elizabeth Taylor or, or uh, just about anybody uh, and feel uh, wonderful and good about yourself. I love the nightlife, and I, I love seeing people have fun nights. There's nothing that makes me happier than to see the people having a good time. Everybody that was there was a star. Thanks, that makes me feel great. It does, because so much bad came out of it, you know, for, for Ian and I, that it's good to think some people think of it like that. The owners of Studio 54, Ian Schrager and Steve Rubell. Two dozen agents raided the chic disco this morning. It's up to 10 years in prison after What was your reaction when you learned that uh, your partner had been arrested? I just go? Uh, yeah, try that. Well, um, you know, I was, I was wondering to myself why after almost 40 years, you know, I would finally feel okay to talk about studio because I hadn't talked about it, you know, at all. Now at a point in my life, uh, that uh, it doesn't sting as much after all this time the way it, it, it used to sting. There's only two people that could have told this story, Steve and I. That's why I'm happy to finally tell the story as it really happened. Hi. You haven't seen the book in a few weeks, so we should look at everything and I have to ask you a couple questions. I've never been in a room with so many celebrities, it was like numb. So we need a picture here? My friendship with Steve was always very close. Almost from the moment we met. We met in college. We both came from Brooklyn. Middle class, lower middle class working families. Everybody uh, upwardly mobile and ambitious. And everybody wanted their kids to do better than they did. Brooklyn made me hungry. My father was a tennis pro, and I played tennis, and I visited these estates, and I saw how people live, and 
you just see this whole other life. You were very well aware of the difference between what they had and what you had. Somehow tennis expanded the universe and you saw that there were other possibilities. We chose as much as possible to try and pursue those avenues of success. In college, Ian was very studious. He wanted to become an attorney. And Stevie was the social butterfly. If you wanted to meet a certain girl, you saw Steve Rubell. If you needed to know what courses to take, you saw Steve Rubell. He knew everybody at Syracuse University. Steve was the most public of people, but he, in fact, was very private. He was never open about his sexuality and the fact that he was gay. It wasn't something we talked about. You know, it didn't matter. Steve was a, an extrovert, and uh, yeah, I'm, I am an introvert. But inside, value-wise, essence-wise, you know, we were the same. After he graduated, I got a job as a lawyer, and then Steve was working on the steak restaurants. Steve was very interested in doing steak restaurants in as many places as fast as he could possibly do it. He had expanded too quickly, and, and, and they weren't doing well. So I acted as his lawyer and kept the creditors at bay. That's when Steve and I became partners. I was the one that wanted to go into the nightclub business because I smelled that there was a real you know, opportunity with it. That ambition, that drive, really forged a, a real bond between us. Steve always felt he had something to, to prove, as I did. From the beginning, they had this intuitive understanding that they were getting out, and they were gonna do something big together. Watergate ended, and everybody all of a sudden was tired of being concerned about outside forces, and they said, I want to have some fun. They were tired of being serious, so everybody went out and went wild. We were going out to clubs in Manhattan all the time and trying to figure out what kind of club we wanted to create. Gay clubs were some of the first clubs that had disco music. But disco was black music, and it came out of black clubs. The beautiful models, the girls, would go to the gay clubs with the gay designers and hairdressers and makeup men. And then the straight guys would want to meet the models, so they would go to these clubs, and it all started blending. For me, as a New Yorker, I'm telling you, this was revolutionary. And it was the first time that it felt like people were non-judgmental. Everybody was fine with everybody else's culture. At that time, gay clubs were behind closed doors, hidden. It was a little bit like going to a speakeasy in the 20s, I suppose. It was subversive, uh, and it was an incredible energy. We wanted to tap you to loose, intense, sweaty, dancing fun that was happening there and take it up a notch. Create the ultimate nightclub. Blow everybody away with it. Dent the universe. Change the world. Ian and I walked into this old opera house, the theater, and Ian and I both saw it, and we both went upstairs and signed the lease.
And some people said we were crazy because we were on 8th Avenue and 54th when the West Side was not, right? In those days it was not. And Mayor Beam said he's going to clean up the streets. We're still waiting. It's very dirty. I'm living here many years when I remember when it was beautiful and now it stinks. 54th and 8th wasn't disnified yet. It was really a very sleazy neighborhood, perhaps the sleaziest neighborhood in the city, the west side in the theater district. If you wanted to get mugged, that was really a good place to go. It was amazing that anyone would think of opening up a discotheque on West 54th Street. In the 20s, it was built as opera house, uh, and there used to be a CBS television studio. And there were some really big time shows that were there. Time now for everybody's favorite guessing game. What's my line? Uh, what's my line? Captain Kangaroo? The $64,000 question? I mean, these are big time television programs. They had all moved to LA and it sat empty for a long time. of studio. It seems like yesterday to me. Well, now there's a, a, a sloped floor here for the theater uh, like there was when we were here 40 years ago. But you know, you can't have a sloped floor and have dancing. So we had to level it off. And we didn't have enough time to get a building permit uh, to do it. Uh, we had to just start working on it immediately. So we said, just go ahead and do it. We had a guy on a tall ladder with a paintbrush uh, yeah. that was maybe 30 feet long right. that he was <laughs> painting right. the ceiling and someone kept moving the ladder. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I worked 30 hours straight right up to the opening. <laughs> yeah, and it was that kind of unbridled energy, you know, that got this whole place built in six weeks. what probably is the best nightclub people in the world, and we wanted to have the best of those of those clubs. First, we went to the usual suspects. They said they couldn't work with us because they were told not to by our competitors. So it was out of that problem that we went to Jules Fisher and Paul Morantz, Tony Award-winning lighting designers. The theater part was already there, and we made as much use of it as possible, which turned out to be a very good idea. And the people we hired to help us were mostly coming from the theater, because this was all at the speed of a theater production. We were hammering and nailing. We were working there. We were wiring. We were doing everything. I don't know. What no unions, no nothing, you know. Remember, I was even a little bit afraid, because we had to have people back here. They were paid $65 a night. That was a lot of money, and I was afraid it was going to impact the margins, and I didn't want to have anybody back here. You know, even having a lighting guy up to that point, no nightclub had a lighting guy. The DJ did the lights. He played the music, and then he played with the lights. There was nothing like it. So we had a DJ, we had a lighting guy, we had two guys on a fly reel back here. Like, we had four people in that thing. Shoot me. There's still some old CBS residual stuff around here, too. CBS left a lot behind that was just lying here for years. What we tried to do was keep it in the context of a theater. All the lighting, everything was designed, the rawness of it, the seeing of the lights. It wasn't designed to be just pretty. It was designed to be a theater. <laughs> just a tremendous amount of detail that went into the dance floor. And of course, all the interior design. You know, we just we had a race ahead and we're doing everything instinctive. Making the club was Ian's job. Steve did not get involved in this kind of stuff, but they were both engineering this whole process of getting the right 
crowd in the club. He and Steve shared the same office, and Steve was always laying on the couch. They were making deals and calling people, and they were sending limousines. They were inviting all the important big names. We were also sending out thousands of invitations. All those things contributed to the groundswell, the buzz. In the crush of everything that was going on, it wasn't possible to get a liquor license in that period of time. As a matter of fact, we kind of forgot about it. It got lost in everything. So we thought we would go up and get a series of one-day catering permits. And so we called our company the Broadway Catering Club. This is the first article ever written on studio. And this is the end of Winterpiece. Then we saw this, says Stephen Rubell, leading a tour around the Forgotten Theater that is, even as we write, becoming New York's newer discotheque. How much did it cost? 400000 I remember that. No, it was more, because we owed, no. him, we owed him money. We owed, we, we owed him money. How much? Yeah, probably another three fifty, four hundred thousand. 400000 Yeah, it was close to 700000 Are you sure, Jack? Because yeah, I always um, remember four hundred. Yeah, yeah, no. Who did you owe money to? To the contractor. And, you know, that made me nervous because I was on the hook. <laughs> you guys weren't. We didn't have anything. <laughs> Jack, why did you do this? Just, uh, One Stephen day. Ian had, had a club, uh, uh, Enchanted Gardens, which is where I met them. We had done a bar mitzvah for him. And I think at that time, it was, it was the first time that anybody had actually done a discotheque for a uh, bar mitzvah. For a bar mitzvah. <laughs> Enchanted Garden it was the first nightclub that Steve and I did. It was a club for the kids in Queens. The first night, Steve went to the bar to hang out with the people, and I went up in the DJ booth to play with the lights. It's not over yet. Our fabulous band from Fiorucci are going to give you a couple more treats, and then we hope you'll join in and dance with them. It was at the Enchanted Garden that we started to throw these extravagant parties. We learned the business and got our feet wet in Queens. But we always wanted to do a nightclub uh, in Manhattan, which was the big leagues. As of tonight, the disco goer becomes the performer. During the night, you'll have sunsets, sunrises, fog machines, snow machines, wind machines. There'll be a tornado about 1.30 at night to get the people... Every night at 1.30, there's going to be a tornado. Right, tonight at 1.30, there'll be a tornado. Where, Where do you take shelter around here? Oh, uh, we hide upstairs in the balcony. <laughs> you can also retreat to the balcony if you don't want to become one of the performers down there. In fact, they encourage you to come up here. Whether you come up here to spectate or not, they give you these binoculars. Christy Fair, Channel 11 Action News, on the balcony, out of the act, at Studio 54. We had everything riding on this club. If it was a failure, it would have been a very, very big failure. And if it was a success, it would have been a big success. The opening night, there is a mob scene it was almost impossible to get close to the door. We didn't have the velvet rope all stretched out. We didn't have adequate security. We had to take all the rest of the security that was in the place and put them out front. And we were afraid. It just might break the, break the door down. All right, please, everybody back up. At first, I was hired as security. But that first night, Steve put me outside the front door. And I was out front from day one. But Mark Beneke became the doorman only because he was the better looking of the rest of the security guys. I'd never worked at a nightclub before. I, you know, just had to, I had to just kind of wing it. 
it was really beyond crazy. I remember getting past the doorman and there was a carpeted, looked like almost a runway, and it was mirrored. The coat room was to the right. I just remember hearing the music and I threw my coat. The coat check was so out of control. I just started giving people tickets who were hanging coats, who were putting coats, and then we were just throwing coats on the floor. Like hundreds of people must have lost their coats that night. It was, it was, it was total pandemonium. Boom, boom, boom. The sound of the music down the hall. There was a rush to get to the dance floor, just a rush. The full blast of the sound, you know, just came over you in a big wave. <laughs> Outside a New York disco called Studio 54. This is the place that's in with the disco crowd, except that these people are still out. Of course, Liza Minnelli and her kind of celebrities sweep right through the protective ranks of doorkeepers. The ropes came about because there were prostitutes on 8th and 54th. In order to keep them out, we put the ropes up, and the ropes became part of the game. Now, do you only admit celebrities? No, no, we admit everybody. Um, How do you choose? What are your criteria for admitting someone? You really know? fun, loving. We want people who are just in there to have fun and not get heavy with each other. People come there to relax. Your favorite couples versus singles? We couples, gay people. Going out in those days, it was all about ego. This was one's lifestyle. If you didn't see somebody at Studio 54, it meant they couldn't get in. What did that mean? <laughs> Every night, there would be a guest list that would be for the front door. There'd be somebody's name on the guest list. Then the next column, there would be pay, comp, or NFU, and NFU meant no fuck up. That meant that Mark had to let him in. We had GN, which really meant NG, which meant no good, which means if they were no good, you don't have to let them in. <laughs> celebrities, uh, some celebrities get special treatment, others don't. Do they get in for nothing? Uh, most of them do, not all. Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, of course, would get in, but some of the other Rolling Stones actually had to pay. <laughs> 
Friday and Saturday night, you know, uh, the so-called bridge and tunnel crowd used to come in. They didn't get into Studio 54. Uh, they probably did go to New York, New York, and Infinity, the Ice Palace, you know, Hurrahs, and other clubs like that. But they weren't coming to Studio 54. Steve was the one that came up with that term, bridge and tunnel. You know, it was his way of explaining that we didn't want people with polyester shirts, gold chains. Polyester melts under the lights. That was, <laughs> that was one we heard a lot. He would split up couples. He would say to the girl, you're really beautiful. You're him, but your boyfriend's got to go home and change into a cotton shirt. <laughs> now, would you let yourself in wearing a shirt like that? This shirt, this is, yeah, this is a good one to let in. These Hawaiian shirts are, are, are a good one. But uh, I don't know if I would have let myself in when the play started. I doubt it really very much if somebody else was choosing. No, actually, it isn't like that. The only thing that it's not based on is money. Has anybody ever offered you sex? Oh, yeah. Do you take yeah. it? Depends on the offer. <laughs> but they have to be hot enough to get inside first, because if they were, then that wouldn't be a problem anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> If you look at the photograph, it's more slightly hopeful throng. You see occasional waved hand and a little grin trying to catch the eye of Mark Benick or Steve. It's like the damned looking into paradise. I don't know. Last time I was here, I got in right away, so I don't know. I guess they either like the way you look or they don't. So I knew what their policy was and how they selected uh, those who are permitted uh, entrance to the inner sanctum, I might, uh, I might even alter my uh, personality and my dress in order to pass inspection, but they uh, apparently keep it a secret. There was a, uh, a passion to get in and a resentment and a hatred if you didn't. We didn't care. We just wanted the success. and Steve were excellent as a PR. Steve just loved getting on the phone and talking to the press and letting them know who was there, what went on, and we got more press than anybody else. Ian called me up and said, let's make a deal. And I would get paid for wrangling the celebrities. If I generated PR around that person, I would get $500 for the cover of the Daily News. If I got them on the cover of the New York Post, it would be an additional $500. And then if I got them into page six, it'd be like $150. So any celebrity that walked in pretty much got on the cover of the New York Post or the Daily News. It was huge news. Anything that happened there was on the cover of the newspapers, was double pages inside, and there were celebrities there every night. Everyone felt like they had to be there or they were missing out. There was this paradigm shift away from reading about crime and, and sports heroes, and people became fascinated with celebrities. It was the beginning of the age of celebrity. We were there at the right time and we wrote it for all that it was worth. The photographers we let in were those that we could control, that would play by the rules that we set up. Here's the Studio 54 box. Here's some of the pictures that I've taken. This is a great shot of uh, Elton John uh, feeling the boobs of Divine. I did miss Bianca, but I got uh, Dolly Parton kissing this horse. In the limousine, I got this great shot of Liz Taylor in the limousine. I call it Fat Liz. Here we have Truman Capote with his robe, and he had 
he had slippers. I have another shot where his slippers with his uh, initials on his slippers. This is Ian Schrager at the stage door looking for an arrival of a celebrity. I don't know which celebrity he was looking for, but Ian was very nice. He was uh, an introvert. He, he was rare, actually. It was a rare time I got that picture. He, he didn't like publicity like you see. Here's a braggadocio. <laughs> here's a braggadocio, Steve Rebell. Here I am. Look at me. He's there with the stars, big stars, small stars. He wanted exposure, and he got it. He got a lot of exposure. With, he's in the pictures. What came first, the photographers or the celebrities? I think the room, it being an old studio, an old theater, it's in it, the lights, and that has a lot to do with it. I mean, you have to build the, ni the nice mousetrap to attract the mice. Steve really took care of these celebrities. He became very friendly with fashion designers like Halston. The press actually came up with this phrase, Halston, Liza, Bianca, Andy, with hyphens between the names. It was like a unit. They were the core group. The studio got so much publicity that it made all of these people more of household names. Hello, Steve. Hi. I go out of my way to take care of them and make them feel comfortable, honestly, because I, I get off on it myself. This was really his dream. His dream was to be the best friends with everyone he saw in the newspapers and in the magazines growing up. And they were. Hi, Michael. Come on in. You can come right in. Hi. How are you? You just walked in. How are you? Michael, this is James Paul. Yeah, come sit over here. Hi. How do you, Michael Jackson? Hi. Good to see you. Come here a lot. Oh God, yes. Why? Because, well, well, I think I like the atmosphere of Studio Fifty Four. I've been to a lot of discotheques and I don't like them. What's Honestly, the difference? All around the world, I've been. I don't know the feeling. I mean, the excitement of the props coming down and the the balcony. It's just exciting. Honestly, people take good care of you here. Yes, Steve's very nice. What's Steve like? He's one of my favorite people because he's genuine and and for real and honest. And that's what I like in people. When you hear the name Studio 54, what does that do? Does it your pulse quicken and your feet start moving? <laughs> yeah, I'm ready to have a good time. It's where you come when you want to escape. It's, it's really escapism. It's that's really what I try to make it be, too, is escapism. In other words, people who have whatever hassles they have all day, they come here and they can forget about them. And you can come here and just be yourself and dance. When you dance here, you just free. You dance with whoever you want to. You just go. I mean, you just go wild. There aren't that many times in life where you're absolutely free. Everybody felt protected and safe. You felt like you're in a place where you could relax. You saw a gay man kissing for the first time there. And celebrities with gay men, and people didn't judge. You could be who you are when you were there. The lighting and everything, I mean, it makes you feel sensuous. All this going on and drinking and thump, thump, thump music and beautiful people everywhere. And it, it makes you want to feel like that. I was wearing lingerie and heels, and I could go to the dance floor and I could dance with everybody. I'd float on the dance floor and dance with. They were all my friends. I mean, I didn't know them, they didn't know me, but they didn't care and I didn't care. So that's how we danced at studio. We danced with the entire club. Disco was a haven for, you know, inclusion, and, and acceptance, and that the street wasn't. Out on the street, homophobia existed much more than, than even today. Um, transgenders took their lives in their hands walking down the street in New York City. But as soon as they stepped foot into the disco, they were safe. 
And not only they were safe, but they were included, they were accepted, they were part of the scene. Do people ever insult you or rude to you? No. No, they're petrified. They think we escaped from a Broadway show. Basically, New York people are very open and very courteous and kind. No, no, that's not true. Only a studio. We truly feel at home here. Yeah, we pay rent right. sort of. $14 is rent, I think. <laughs> at Studio 54, gay energy was bigger than life. The influence filled the room and filled the space. The mantra at studio was you were in a fantasy and you could be anyone you wanted to be for that moment in time. And people did. All that love and affection. Thank you, Will Arena. I really needed that. Will Arena was a Wall Street banker by day, a fairy godmother by night. <laughs> Disco Sally was a lawyer, and she was uh, about 78 years old. I was against Disco Sally at the beginning because I thought it was, I thought the whole thing was kind of gimmicky. And was Steve like, no, no, you're wrong, you're wrong. This is good for the club, it's good for the club. Kutasa, who was like the most fabulous drag queen of that whole era, she was 5'11 out of shoes. Uh, and 6'6 so six, six in shoes. And you never, ever, 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 ever saw her out of drag. And she held center stage when she wanted to. What's really beautiful about the studio, the combination of people. If you put just the beautiful people, so-called, together, then they, they are used to seeing each other. They might even get bored of them. But if you mix them properly, which was the case of the studio, with all the bizarre characters and the transvestites and all that, they liked the combination. I think it was a wonderful cocktail. That diversity created this combustible energy. It was tribal almost. Like that wild abandonment, that freedom was all part of it. It was like an adult amusement park. They had a real sense of what people wanted, you know, adults wanted. In the 70s, there was this kind of window of opportunity between the invention of the pill and the advent of AIDS. So even if you weren't promiscuous or sleeping with someone different every night, you felt like you could. You know, love was in the air. Sex was in the air. In the balconies, it was dark. People would make out and maybe somebody would give somebody a blowjob. Same thing in the bathrooms. Basement. And I went down there and I slept with a lot of people. A lot. Gay people had the advantage because no one was getting pregnant. So basically, you could just go out there and have a blast, and you could have sex as much as you want, and there was no repercussions, and why not? Because you're supposed to now. It's all about freedom. You could try anything. huge coat that he would wear a lot of times, and in that coat was money and drugs, and it was like Daddy Warbucks. Steve was big on quaaludes, to be quite frank about it. He loved giving out the quaaludes. If you say, Steve, I don't want a quaalude, he'd say, oh, just take a half. Oh, I don't think you're a priest, are you? You're too much of a bad boy. He always wanted to get the party going to another level. You could say higher and lower, and I'll leave that open to interpretation. Everybody, come on. Think this happens anywhere else in the world? No. No, if I was all over the world, I, I, I'm happy. <laughs> the music, the lights, supple-bodied young waiters dressed in nothing but shorts, and drinks at £1.50 a glass. The formula has made the owner a very rich young man. He enjoyed every night. I mean, Steve probably had more fun than anybody. 
and the environment we created allowed him to be comfortable and accept his sexuality, maybe for the first time in his whole life. He was in his element. To me, he was different. I didn't want to walk through the crowd and have to be poked. People say hello. All the time that Studio 54 existed, you rarely saw pictures of Ian or read anything about Ian. Ian was behind the scenes, but he was the brilliant mind in designing in a way that had never been seen. People were just obsessed with what he was going to do next. There was a theatrical quality of the place that I'd never seen before. It was an experience touching like pretty much all of your senses. It's a visceral business. You have really no discernible product except the magic you create. Lights and sets and changing the environment from one second to the next. That had never been done before. Ian really created a world of fantasy. It was a transformation of individuals into this sort of group energy that absolutely exploded. genius for creating experiences for people. We went right up to the edge. In every single aspect of it. Building code modalities, taste levels, social mores, everything right up to the edge. It would cost as much as forty or fifty thousand dollars just for the one night. We wanted to break down that barrier between the audience and the performers and introduce the idea that anything could happen, and it did. Everybody who worked there knew we were cast members. We were putting on a show, and everybody had to give an incredible performance and give an incredible service. I was addicted to Studio 54, without any question. I had to go there every night, and so did a lot of people. Studio 54 is probably the Mount Olympus of the disco world. Right now, it is the center of the universe for those who dance to 125 beats a minute. Studio 54, the definitive disco here in New York City. So excited, so high on, on the success that I would count the money at night, which I enjoyed. You know, dump the money out of the bag, kind of arrange it, and then split it up. And, you know, and I would make three piles uh, and bring in a pile for Steve and a pile for Jack. One thing that I think if you hung out there you did notice was that they changed the cash register receipt roll in the middle of the night. That began to get out. People began to notice that. It was about the exhilaration of having this great success on life's dream. We had the best crowd in the world. We had the best press. We had the best club. We were number one. Suddenly on top of the world, they were living a, in a dream, practically. It was becoming so much fun that they were losing touch with reality. I was up in my office with a girl. 
and I heard the music stop. Well, I walked downstairs, and Steve was already over there. You're encompassed in this little world, and all of a sudden, the lights were on, the police were there, and it was like, the reality was in your face, like, holy shit. We were both under arrest. We still didn't have a liquor license, so we were getting catering permits every night, but, you know, at a point in time, they're like, okay, why are these guys coming every night for a catering permit? They're a nightclub, and everybody knows it. Roy Cohn was our lawyer at the time. I had called him and, uh, to help us. Their lawyer was Roy Cohn. And I knew he was also an attorney for mob guys and heavy-duty people in Manhattan. And that kind of made sense to me, that there's a reason they're not afraid of much. After a few hours, we were released. We were able, you know, to keep the plays open for six months with no liquor. Then we finally got the license. I have a picture of me and Steve holding the liquor license when we got it. And from that moment on, we felt like we conquered the world. They thought they were so important that they could do anything. But people started to get angrier and angrier at Steve Rubell and at Studio 54 because they couldn't get in. You can't have this much popularity without somebody somewhere being envious or wanting to take it down. I mean, it's human nature. It's just the way life is. The Dan Dorfman article, Steve said, only the mafia does better, but don't tell anybody. Part of Stevie was a braggart, you know? Look what I'm doing, I'm having the best time, and we're making tons of money, and he was very proud about that. I thought it was the stupidest thing I'd ever seen, and when I called him, I said, y you're asking the IRS to just come knocking at your door? And he said, no, no, no one's gonna bother me. Close to two dozen IRS agents raided the Sheik Disco this morning, armed with a warrant to search and seize any and all records relating to the club's finances. We got raided on December 14th, uh, 1978. December 14th, it, it was just a terrible day. The Studio 54 case began with an allegation of a gigantic skimming operation, that there was cash and drugs hidden at Studio 54. Uh, one of the cleaning guys called me and said, there's some guys here, um, and they have warrants. So I called Steve. Steve said there were some quaaludes in the safe, and if I can run over and see if I can get them out. But uh, I ran into the feds while I was in the basement. And they said, you're the manager? I said, yeah. And they said, well, come on, uh, you know, open the safe. 27, 42, 37, da, 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 two this way, one this way, one this way, clink, pump, and open. I said, is this everything? And that's when I said, well, there's a couple of boxes up above here, too. First of all, I tried to open the door, and somebody pulled it back, because they were already in here. Yeah. So I put my key in and tried to open it, and they pulled it back. And then, eventually, the federal marshal, whatever it is, opened it. This is 9 o'clock in the morning, by the way. Federal marshal opened it and said something. Do you want to come in? Do you not want to come in? So I came in. I had all my papers with me like I normally have. I put them down on the floor. Then I walked in. Ian Schrager, one of the owners of Studio 54, entered the club sometime later. And agents say that among his records, they found cocaine. It wasn't in my books, it was around my books. And then they came in, I put my books on the floor. Maybe it was left from the night before, who knows? The field test kit showed positive presence of cocaine. Not only was it positive, the thing was off the charts, pure. It looked like it had been cut right off the key, as they say in the narcotics business. If you're going to walk onto the premises that are being searched by 50 IRS agents with cocaine under your arms, don't walk in. <laughs>
turn around and go somewhere else. <laughs> I was arrested, and my first call was to Roy Cohn's office, and um, he came down immediately and uh, advised us to overturn all the furniture in the office and make it look like uh, the agents turned everything upside down, like a Gestapo. They even ruined my birthday presents. <laughs> And it got everybody even more pissed off at us uh, because it wasn't true. And they said they were very careful to keep uh, everything very neat. That kind of started the litany of mistakes we made in this thing because that made the front page of the Daily News. I don't think we realized the, the uh, seriousness of, um, of what we got into ourselves involved with because we are getting away with everything. Yeah, they were interviewing Ian. <laughs> Ian was sitting in a chair with the chair turned around, leaning on it like this, like defiant. Kind of like with, like, fuck you. <laughs> You'd think he'd be scared, but he wasn't. He was, he was pissed. Seven hours after the raid began, co-owner Steve Rubell emerged with lawyer Roy Cohn, who blasted the IRS. Well, well, you tell me one other instance in American history when 23 internal revenue agents at the beginning of an investigation, before they even go to a company's accountants or lawyers, come in and raid a place, tear it to pieces, open up everything in sight. Uh, if that's ever happened before in America, I've never seen it. In his oh, what was it? Was it cocaine? Right briefcase. It was not in his briefcase. They do not allege it was in his briefcase. I've read the complaint, and I was in court, and What's you weren't. Is there any right. like What do you got? Wait a minute. We have to fight to get a lawyer into this place. I came in through the front door to get in. It's the first time I had trouble getting in here. Take it for a tour. I don't make a You can take it for a tour. What about the cocaine? I don't know anything about that. I really don't know anything about that. Are there that. any other drugs on the premises? I don't know anything about any other drugs. Did on you know anything about drugs on the premises this time? No, I didn't. Absolutely not. Were, what was your reaction when you learned that uh, your partner had been arrested? Okay. I, 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 I'm very fond of Ian. We went to college together. We met in college, and I, he's a good guy. And uh, of course, I was upset. Well, was Coke use common at studio? No, I, I like. Roy said I, I don't want to really comment on anything to do with the, the legal case, but uh, you know. Steve, look this way, please. Thank you. I feel like the president today. We had had every great lawyer working for us. You know, we had had uh, one of the lawyers that had represented John Mitchell on Watergate. We had James Neal, uh, who had sent Jimmy Hoffa to jail. Uh, we had had Arthur Lyman. We had had uh, Mitchell McGovern, who was part of uh, Arnold and Porter, where Abe Fortas came from, and he was a Supreme Court justice. We circled the wagon, and we got ready to fight the government. There are, incidentally, 37 lawyers working on behalf of Schrager and, and Rubel. When they were raided, it was real schadenfreude here in New York City. They finally got what was coming to them, people felt. They had their loyal friends, but nobody was running around with their head in their hands, oh, poor Steve Rubel, poor Ian Schrager. None of that happened. People kind of liked it. And now following up on the Studio 54 stories, weekend update correspondent Lorraine Newman outside Studio 54. Lorraine? Thank you, Bill. Standing next to me is Steve Rebell, co-owner of the club. <laughs> Steve, what was your reaction when you learned cocaine had been found here? I was shocked. It was more of, you know, taking on the institution, taking on the system, which was all part of the Studio 54 mystique. And I think everybody rallied around, and it was a party after that. The notoriety was like a moth to a flame, and everybody came, and it got even bigger, which controversy uh, sometimes does. A lot of people say, well, Rubel was shooting off his mouth about 
don't tell the IRS this and don't tell the IRS that. That was not it. This case came about strictly because of an informant who was very unhappy with his treatment at Studio 54 and knew where the records were kept. The basement had a drop ceiling. And if you remove the ceiling tiles, that's where we found the manila envelopes that were, in effect, the second set of books. Also up there in garbage bags, plastic garbage bags, there was cash. Absolutely never any millions of dollars in the ceiling of Studio 54. That's um, just folklore. They took down bags of cash, which had been particularly described in the search warrant. It was like five combinations, and you had a, it's like, oh, man, this is a pain in the neck. The guys are all dying for quarters, so I'll keep the quarters up top. It's as simple a as it was. But that was the money in the ceiling <laughs> story. There was also cash in a uh, safe deposit box that belonged to Steve Rubell that we got a warrant for. We drilled the box. We got cash out of there. There was also cash in his apartment. There were secret doors behind bookcases. Steve had 900,000 in cash, fives and tens, stacked. The feds came, took all that. And I was driving around with $400,000 in the trunk of my car. It could have been stolen, it could have been towed. <laughs> I mean, I was parking in garages. It was ridiculous. At studio, Steve's mother was the bookkeeper, and Steve always had a budget for recreational drugs. He would give them for free to certain people. Steve's mother didn't know anything about the drugs and what the codes were, but she knew where every penny was going. There was $100 taken out to get a celebrity a drug, so, or oh, whatever. It was recorded as a party favor, so it had everything in there. There was one envelope. On the outside of the envelope were three columns, Ian, Steve, and Jack. And then there was a fourth column, which was the total amount of the take for that night. And then there was a fifth column that was labeled SKIM, S-K-I-M, or S-K. So that you had a daily record of everything that they took in and what they took out as SKIM and didn't report. Who created those books? I didn't, because um, I wasn't the bookkeeper or taking care of the books. But one of us did. I, I... Who instructed the, those books we created? You know, I, I, I don't remember. <laughs> you sure you're not a prosecutor here? I, um... You know, all I know is that I got the benefit of it, and and I was a uh, co-conspirator, uh, and um, you know, but you know the actual you know workings and all I don't I don't know who did it. In the 33 months that they were doing, I think there was skim of two and a half or three million dollars, an astronomical amount to skim which was ridiculous. I mean, if you're gonna skim, you know, skim 10% or 20, you know, not 80%. They were really, you know, pigs about it. Well, this was the Richard Nixon of skims, which just went way over and way beyond, you know, anything that was uh, even remotely possible to go unnoticed. Steve Rubell and Ian Schrager are totally and completely innocent of this claim for additional taxes or any kind of evasion of taxes. Calling charges, there was only one partner to blame for the troubles at Studio 54. That's the man who keeps the books. His name is Jack Dushy. He secretly pleaded guilty to charges last week, and he now faces up to five years in prison. Jack Dushay agreed to cooperate and to testify against Rubel and Schrager in the grand jury and at the trial if one was necessary. What happened wasn't his fault. He had a whole family. He would have never done it. 
I never asked you that. No. But that's what I've uh, I always felt. Were you, Jack, were you resentful? It was very difficult to put reins on the success. You know, who am I? I uh, first of all, I was older than them. And, you know, I, I didn't need the money. I wasn't doing it for the money. But uh, the, the, this was an overwhelming success. So I wasn't about to try to harness them. And, you know, the, you know we all paid the price. I mean, but did you know what was going on in the counting house? No, I was right in the middle of it. Uh, yeah, I was right in the middle of it. I was just as culpable as, you know, Steve and Ian. But you seem so level-headed. Um, why do you think you let that happen? Uh, the success. The success went to everybody's head. Yeah. I was assigned to the Organized Crime Strike Force, which deals mostly with organized crime, in particular, at that time, the Italian Mafia. The Studio 54 case, there was a supposed connection to organized crime through Ian Schrager, whose father was Louis Schrager, also colloquially known as Max the Jew. I have always heard all these things about my father and the newspapers, and I didn't really know anything about it. I idolized my father. Uh, I knew he was different than other fathers, you know, with his hours of work, and I was always concerned that that would be a uh, problem for me. I was always very sensitive to that. Louis Schrager, who had, had died at the time, was uh, an old Meyer Lansky associate. But we never found any evidence that Studio 54 had a mafia link. I, I definitely think that Ian didn't want any part of his father's business or connections or anything. I mean, his father was successful at what he did. His father had power. And I think that Ian wanted power and success in a different area. Three owners and the manager of the Studio 54 Disco were indicted today on charges of income Steve tax Steve Rubel and Ian Schrager were slapped with a 12th yeah, count indictment. Clean. Now Ian Schrager and Steve Rubel face up to 10 years in prison and fines up to $20,000. They had this ball of fire that nobody in the world had. They had this, this thing that was worldwide popular that had fallen into their laps. And I don't think they wanted to lose that. During one of the meetings, you know, the lawyers kept saying, well, you know, you have to try and trade something. It was August 25th. I remember Steve telling me, I hope there's a war in Iran. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I just don't, there's a story that's going to break, and I just don't want it to be big. The Justice Department is investigating an allegation that White House Chief of Staff Hamilton Jordan used cocaine during a visit to New York Studio 54 discotheque last year. The White House flatly denies the allegation, saying the people making them have a clear interest in making false and sensational charges so they can bargain for lighter sentences. To accuse the White House Chief of Staff of asking to buy cocaine in the basement of Studio 54, I mean, didn't Steve realize he now was going to have the White House against him? I thought, Steve, better be really careful. These people are powerful. He doesn't have any power. He's a not life person. His power is among celebrities. It's not among the politicos. And he definitely messed with the wrong people. President Carter's comment about Jordan was, he will tell the truth as my wife would or my children. While the Justice Department would not ordinarily pursue a case involving individual use of the drug, it's compelled to do so in this case because of a new law called the Ethics in Government Act. That law grew out of the Watergate scandals. It requires an investigation of up to 90 days by the FBI when criminal allegations are made against high-ranking government officials. One of the lawyers, Mitchell McGovern, made a really fatal mistake and hurt us. 
didn't understand how Watergate changed the law. It became very public. The train left the station. It took a life of its own. There was no turning back. You saw with your own eyes Hamilton Jordan use cocaine. Yes. No question. No question. No mistake. No. We didn't realize the magnitude of what was going on. We had to think that, you know, we'll get, we'll get out of it. You know, we got Roy there, but, you know, we'll figure out a way and get, we'll get a way out of it. We even went and did uh, a uh, major renovation in the club. It's like a signal to everyone, this is going to be fine. What do you do when you're under indictment for tax evasion and fighting Hamilton Jerdom in your spare time? Well, you can create a new image, architecturally at least. 600 workers and round-the-clock shifts have been laboring since last Wednesday to put it all together. And when they're finished, it's expected to cost one and a half million dollars, three times what it cost to open Studio 54 three years ago. these magical ideas he'd seen Sweeney Todd and he got this idea to do a bridge tired of fighting your way through the crowded dance floor well this moving bridge ought to be able to solve that problem it can carry 25 tons in weight and will be able to move 250 people over the heads of the dancers to the other side of the room or to the balcony at a speed of 45 feet a minute of course the story goes that they had to cover the balcony in rubber so they could wash it down more easily. Were you aware that you were creating a sex pit? Yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> I thank you for making all my evenings a lot more fun. Oh, uh, what can I say? <laughs> oh, just say thank you. Plead guilty. The charges are flattering. I don't plead guilty to any charge. <laughs> Two owners of the trendy Manhattan discotheque Studio 54 pleaded guilty today of defrauding the government of more than $400,000 in taxes. Today, Rubel and his partner Ian Schrager were charged with skimming two and a half million dollars from the receipts of Studio 54 and lying about it, 12 counts in all. They admitted to two counts of tax evasion. The government dropped the rest. We didn't want to plead guilty to a felony because you can't have a liquor license if you're convicted of a felony. So this whole thing was to protect Studio, but it just got out of control. We were out of our league and we were forced to plead to a, a felony. Okay. Well, Roy, did anything go wrong with the plea bargaining? Listen, when you have about 37 lawyers involved in anything, uh, something's always going to go wrong. What made you do it? Was it green? Too much money, too fast? I made a mistake. Did you ever make a mistake? Why you made you make so Are you and Schrager still friendly anybody? after this? He's my best friend, and I love him dearly. When we got in trouble, the press, you know, turned on us. It was the first time you know, in my life and in Steve's life we couldn't talk our way out of it. It was like we couldn't shake it. Things seemed to be closing in on us. When you go through something like that, uh, it either makes you closer and stronger or it tears you apart. In our case, it made us stronger. We rose and fell together. A federal judge today sentenced Stephen Rubel and Ian Schrager, owners of the New York discotheque Studio 54, to three and a half years in prison for evading almost half a million dollars in income taxes. He also fined each man $20,000. It didn't hit me. You know, there was a complete emotional detachment. I was numb. Our life was over. We didn't even know. The party the night before they went to jail was probably as exciting 
and as much fun as the opening party. It may have been more fun. Andy Warhol was there, Calvin Klein. Diana Ross sang, Liza Minnelli sang too. What I distinctly remember, Steve was wearing like a Frank Sinatra hat and they played I Did It My Way. My way, what does that mean, my way? When I look back at it now, it is so preposterous. What were we thinking? Was still intense, and it was fabulous. Oh, Partying that night, I remember all I wanted to do was dance. And I was so high on drugs, I really didn't realize what was going on. I mean, I didn't think the party was going to end. Oh, that feeling of invincibility permeated the whole process. Enormous denial, you know, from beginning to end. I'm not sure I would have made a party to celebrate the fact I'm going to jail the next day. I don't think they prepared at all. And I think it was the actual going to jail was just a terrific shock for them. The owners of New York's flashy discotheque Studio 54 surrendered to federal authorities today. They reported this morning at the Federal Metropolitan Correctional Center. Meanwhile, the State Liquor Authority has filed seven charges against the disco. What was that first night like at the Metropolitan House of Corrections here in New York City? Well, uh, the doors closed, and when those doors closed, it's amazing how quickly you um, just realize you lost your freedom. There's nothing worse in the world. We didn't share a cell. We were in the same jail. And that's something that we both wanted, obviously. We couldn't guarantee that. I don't know what it would have been if we didn't have the benefit of having Steve there. We were treated just like everybody else, right. uh, not unfairly. They didn't care that you were with Liza and no. Bianca and all those Oh, guys. that has, that's another world. Yeah. It's how it is. You just have to learn, keep your mouth shut, and, and not say a word. If you say a word, you're, you're, uh, uh, you're dead. There was a guy that lived across the hall from me uh, and who had killed somebody with a bowling ball. Um, and so I right away thought that was a good guy to get friendly with. I made a deal with him that we would give his wife money on the outside and he would protect us. You know, it was just a base instinct to survive in, in, in there. After they went to jail, we had another couple of months, but it was never the same after, you know, without Steve and Ian. And then when we lost the liquor license, there wasn't much we, we could do. It was in prison that, um, you know, we sold Studio 54. Uh, and uh, I was negotiating the contract. Uh, and uh, that kept my sanity. But selling Studio <laughs> was uh, the hardest thing I ever had to do. Thing. It was like a vortex of, you know, it was all just going down the tubes. And everybody just faded back to where they came from. You really feel like 
all these people are really going to be your friends for life, they, they love you, and then you really find out, well, that's really not the case at all. You know, the phone calls stop coming, the, you know, the, uh, the invitations to great parties stop coming, all those things just stop, and that was, uh, that was, uh, that was a rude awakening for me. The disco era was over. Disco music became a joke. It was billed as teen night at Comiskey Park. The feature attraction was a disco demolition between games. Local radio morning man Steve Dahl was to lead the crowd in song and then finish by blowing up a box full of disco records which the fans were to bring with them to the ballpark. Disco Sucks was almost a backlash against Studio 54 in a way. You think about the economic situation in America. It was the worst financial recession since the Great Depression. And you think about what Studio 54 and what disco life looked like to somebody working in the Midwest who now lost their job and is never coming back. You know, you blame it on all these people. You blame it on gay people. You blame it on black people. You blame it on women. There was this ground-swelling resentment. People, you know, were, were pissed off. We upset the status quo. We knew Rebell and Schrager could help us and could give us more income tax evasion cases against other people that they knew who were doing the same thing. So we devise the great Chinese food scenario. The US Attorney's Office is on the border of Chinatown and the IRS agents know all the good places to eat, trust me. So they ordered a slew of different Chinese dishes. And I had Steve and Ian brought over and I had two chairs set out just outside my office so that the smell was kind of wafting out into the hall. And they're looking at it, and they're, you know, they're hungry. We really tried everything. We were under all kinds of pressure. The government had all our records. It isn't as if, you know, we named names, but we would have had to perjure ourselves if we didn't answer questions about the nightclub owners of Bonds, Infinity, and New York, New York at the time. They were like kind of our enemies. You know, we uh, always suspected that, that those guys were out to hurt us anyways. So it was kind of easy way to rationalize it, I suppose. But my father wouldn't have, uh, have liked this. You know, because you just, uh, it's just not something you do. You know, um, do your time like a man. Wouldn't be something that he would, uh, you know, no want, want, want me to do. And did that weigh upon you? Of course. I had problems. I, I still have problems, but I'm still embarrassed about it. It's one of the things uh, I was hoping you wouldn't get into. But I... You know, I, um, it's, uh, just part of the story, I suppose. You couldn't stay in prison for three and a half years. So we did what we had to do and got a reduced sentence. When we got out of prison in 1981, uh, it was a whole different world. Looks like as of eight o'clock tonight. Hey! 
you had a different administration in the early 80s, and suddenly it was all about making money. It wasn't about abandon, it wasn't about equalization. It was about massive, obvious success, and a dollar Uber all us. Downtown became more downtown. The Mud Club really became dominant in protest against the yuppies and the Reagan administration. Getting out of jail, we were both really, really, really sensitive. Both unsure of ourselves. You know, that's a devastation that's hard to explain. You lose everything. You know, I lost my law license. I couldn't vote. Even a driver's license, your credit card. I disenfranchised. It's, you know, you don't realize till you can't what it means to you and the shame of it. That was the real thing. One of the things I guess that's a little bothersome is that there is no stigma attached to the fact that you did jail time. Oh, but there, is a there isn't a day that goes by when I don't think about it. Okay. The, the, it's an emotional stigma. It's emotional. Okay. Uh, until about a year ago, I had dreams that I was on an island and I couldn't get off. And the nightmares, I would wake up soaked. And uh, uh, it's something you don't get over. Fair enough. Steve was kind of tentative because he didn't know the way people were going to be reacting to him just that they didn't know if they could trust them. After the Hamilton Jordan and everything. The price of being a success, you know, it, 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 you know, is easy. The price of being a failure is difficult. I went through both. That was probably the most difficult moment of their life, wondering if they would ever emerge. In a sense, they had nothing to lose early on. They had nothing. Everything was an improvement. It was fine. Coming back, that was courage. Ian's not going to give up. Stevie, in his own way, isn't going to give up. They both had the same DNA when they went in and when they got out. They'll take on any challenge, and they did. I mean, I believe they were plotting to come back in prison. Of course. The day they got in, they were thinking about what we're going to do when we get out. Despite Rebel's plans, post-prison reality was harsh. It took three years before the two could find the capital to finance their next venture a string of luxury hotels that catered to the same kind of eclectic crowd that used to hang out at Studio 54. They immediately began channeling their efforts into purchasing prime Manhattan real estate, becoming part owners in several chic hotels, including the Royalton and Morgan's Hotel on Madison Avenue. We wanted to be in the hotel business, but we had to prove to the banks that we could borrow $14 million and pay it back. So that was the reason why uh, we opened up Palladium nightclub. The bald, the brave, and the beautiful came out tonight for the opening of the Palladium. It's an incredible thing that with Steve and Ian out of the picture for six or seven years, really nothing has come along to replace them. And now they're back and bigger and better than ever. I had hesitations about everything I did because I had made a mistake and I had not felt so great about myself for a while. I got a second chance and they couldn't ask anything more. When we did the Palladium, this was the first press piece we got called the Comeback Kids, where I came out from the shadows. The story uh, was uh, as much on me as it was on, on Steve. Steve was a little bit upset about it. And um, the story disrupted that balance that existed between Steve and I all those years uh, in terms of him being out there getting all, all of the attention and me being in the background and not getting any. Uh, it was a new dynamic. I remember it took him a little while to, to, to get over it. We should point out, for better or for worse, Studio 54 is no longer. Yeah, I read in the paper the other day it was just closed, but... How did um, you feel about that? Um, I, 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 you know, I'm almost a little of, it's something of the past, and I, I still not want to dwell on the past, sure. the good or the bad. I'm always futuristic in what I can do next and what opportunities we can, you know, that Ian and I can come up with, and, you know, life is so exciting. So how did you find out that Steve had contracted HIV? I did a blood test. 
did you suspect that he was becoming ill with that? He had some symptoms, not of HIV, but they were vague symptoms. And I was the one that told him he had AIDS, yeah. You have to remember AIDS at that time, it wasn't a disease. It was a condemnation. And so he wouldn't let me tell our parents. He held it together and I'm sure he didn't hold it together after I left, but he held it together. Everybody was getting sick. It was frightening and if I'm still emotionally affected by it, the loss was profound. All of these young guys were, were just fading away. Half the bartenders, you know, half the people that did the sets, the kids that painted, they're not with us anymore. It's devastating. The impact that these people had on the community, on the culture, on New York City, such an incredible loss. Culturally, it changed everything. Steve is that kind of guy that, you know, if he did something the night before that might have been a little embarrassing, you would see him the next morning and he would act like nothing happened and get away with it, and that would be the end of it, where somebody might come into the room with the tail between their legs, terribly embarrassed. So Steve was always able to get away with it. Just one thing you didn't get away with. Bell changed the look, the feel, and the pace of New York's nightlife when he opened up Studio 54 some years ago. Well, Rubel died this morning here in Manhattan from complications of hepatitis. Steve Rubel died of complications resulting from hepatitis and septic shock. Steve Rubel, who died yesterday of liver failure. There were rumors that Rubel succumbed to AIDS, but the official word is that he died of hepatitis and septic shock. He didn't want the press to put in the obit that he died of complications of AIDS. That was kept out. I wanted to, you know, make sure everybody came to the funeral because that's what Steve would have wanted. It was like a big send-off. So I was on the phone making calls to make sure everybody would, you know, would come. The funeral for that people person turned out the chic of New York City society, from Calvin Klein to Bianca Jagger to his partner Ian Schrager, who at times looked shaken. Losing Steve was like losing a family member. So it was a, a very difficult day and a very difficult time. I think it, it hit every one of our studio family who knew him felt the same way. After the brief service, some from Rubel's past said they saw his death as emblematic of the passing of an era. He gave a magic to the city. And the city always needs magic. And it always finds its... Uh, it's Marka, and Steve was it for an awful lot of years. Steve Rubel dead at 45. And Mrs. Rubel said to me, why didn't Steve ever get married? And I realized then that I'm not sure that she really knew that he was gay. That was part of that time, that time of maybe your mother was the last to know. Steve's death and his illness had a huge impact on um, Ian. Their love for each other and their bond was so strong um, that I think it, it made an impact for quite some time. Steve, I think I was 18 uh, or 19, and the friendship blossomed right away, and I was friendly with him for all that time, right up to 1989. I'm lucky that I had one of those friendships. Not many people 
you don't do. Steve and I bought this house in 1985. Has a lot of history, this house. It's like a family heir. For that, it's quite beautiful. How did the death of your partner, your best friend, affect you? It was devastated. It was a personal loss. Steve and I were really like a husband and wife. I'm not sure which one was the husband and which one was the wife. We vacationed together. We shared a house in Long Island together. We worked together. We, 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 he was the last person I talked to when I went to sleep. And so it, it was a personal loss. Uh, 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 more than anything else. Uh, on the business end of it, the, the same passion that drove me while Steve was alive still drove me. I had the same hunger. I still have that same hunger now, and so we just continued on. Uh, uh, it, it's not as much fun. It's not as exhilarating. I don't have someone to share it with, but, but we just, you know, you go on. Did you ever doubt that you could do it? Of course. I still doubt it. I think that's what drives me. It's not a surprise to me that through all these years, Ian has evolved and reinvented himself and taken that core of who he is to where he is today. I was trying to capture energy in the hotels in the same way you might capture energy on the streets of a city. You know, there's an energy that lifts everything a high tide that comes in. That was the same thing with studio. Studio just meant everything to us. What we had gone through together, both of us ingrained with that desire to be successful. I didn't get it as a lawyer, and he didn't get it as a steak restaurateur, but we both got it together with studio. What they created, nobody has come near since then. You know, there was a brevity to it. There was a sense of something lost, paradise lost. I don't think they had any idea what it would become, that it would become this world famous, that it would be important in our culture and the history of New York City, and maybe significant in the history of what was going on all around the world. Studio was under my club. It was like a, a kind of social experiment. And that's why it's never been able to be recreated. It was fun holding onto a lightning bolt. sharing this one and only life ending up 
just another lost and lonely wife. You count up the years. 